Of course, we know about the oil market, the fruit and vegetable market, the sugar market. What do they have in common? Buyers and sellers everywhere always look out for their own interests. The law of supply and demand controls these exchanges. The crime world is no exception to the rule. All trafficking has an economic reason to exist. A mafia, a criminal enterprise, is first and foremost a business with its own products to deliver and services to perform. The organized crime market generates around $870 billion a year. Where does this money come from? Trafficking in every form. The more illegal it is, the more profitable it is. So who are the main players in these underground markets? How are they organized? Who benefits from the illegal profits? This is what Dirty Dollars reveals. It's a journey behind the scenes of the criminal economy. In reality, trafficking drugs, weapons, or other illegal products only concerns a small part of the population. There are relatively few customers around the world for organized crimes. It's certainly one of the reasons that pushed them to develop a much more universal market. Much more profitable and 10 times less risky. Trafficking counterfeit medicines. There's a uh, high profit to be made, and on the other hand, the enforcement risk is very, very low. They are killers. It deserves to be repeated. They are criminals. They're not just traffickers. If, you, if you're not taking your heart medication and you think you are, then placebo is harmful too. They're sellers of death. They're sellers of illusion and criminals. They must be hunted down. One pill can kill one person. If you see that we intercept tons of medicines each year, which stands for millions of pills. In just a few years, counterfeit medicine trafficking has become organized crime's most profitable activity. But it's also its deadliest. To compare, there are approximately 200,000 homicides in the world each year. During the same time period, taking fake medicine is thought to be the cause of over 700,000 deaths. A medication is a product that contains at least one active ingredient that's capable of changing our metabolism. Found in good pharmacies everywhere, medicine is a chemical compound that comes from years of scientific research. Production and distribution are carefully controlled by health authorities because the pharmaceutical market is a public health issue. If there are rules, you can circumvent them and make money. Criminal organizations quickly recognize this, so they are trying to carve out an increasingly larger share for themselves outside the pharmaceutical industry's traditional market. Françoise Dorsier is the coordinator of a global health protection program within the International Police Force. An important traffic for us at Interpol is something that affects all parts of the world. And unfortunately, that's what we're seeing with fake drugs, which is spreading everywhere. No region is spared. Medicine trafficking is growing year after year. To try to understand how this traffic is organized and to attempt to determine its framework, we'll look at it from a purely economic point of view. A market, whether it's legal or illegal, always requires the same organization. It needs factories for manufacturing, effective marketing, combined with distribution networks in order to reach as many customers as possible. The goal is high profits. The counterfeit medicine trade is no exception to this rule. How is the medicine made and who is behind this traffic? To find out, let's begin at the beginning, at the first stage of production. First of all, we should define what counterfeit medicine is. You could say that it's anything but medicine, but it's not that simple. Sandra Vens is an expert in the fight against fake drug trafficking for the World Customs Association. Well, we, we can see that as two different types of products. At one point, you have the real counterfeit products, the fake ones. It's just a copy. It looks the same from the outside, but they don't use active ingredients or they just use pesticides or just some, some powder to copy a pill and that goes then to the market. In best case scenario, there's no active ingredient or less active ingredients, but it doesn't really kill people. 
Um, from the other hand, we also have illicit medicines. At one point, that can be medicines that are licit in a certain market, but in illicit in another market, um, that, are, that don't have authorization to be imported in the country because it doesn't uh, comply with the national rules. It's the role of health authorities like the MHRA, the English Regulatory Agency for Medicines, to make sure that the drugs sold in pharmacies have been approved for sale, but especially that their shipping conditions were optimal. If this distribution chain is not respected, we end up with illegal medicine. So that could be a medicine that is legitimate, but is falsified because of the route that is taken to market and the paperwork that's gone to that. So for example, it may have been sitting out in a container in 40 degrees sun, and that heat will have degraded the medicine itself and the active pharmaceutical ingredient. But of course, the paperwork won't show that. So it's a legitimate medicine, but it's falsified because of the paperwork. And there are a whole range of different types of falsifications, and that's much, much wider than counterfeit. And you know, you might think that the falsifi falsification is less dangerous, but in actual fact, it, it's equally as dangerous because if it's not in the regulated supply chain and it's not licensed to go on, on the regulated market, you don't know where it's been. You don't know what the active ingredient is. You don't know if it's too much or it's too little or if there's anything at all. So you are gambling with your health. Illegal or counterfeit, they have to be made somewhere. From an industrial point of view, we must turn to Asia to find two of the biggest trafficking sources, China and India. First of all, these countries are the biggest producers of medicine and raw pharmaceutical materials for the legal market. Dr. Mark Gentilini works for the Fondation Chirac, an organization that has made the fight against falsified medication its main priority. Oui, le, le circuit du faux médicament est bien connu. Il est Fake medicines are a well-known circuit. It is broadly produced in Asia, mainly China and India, two economic giants that should be an example for other bordering countries. Both countries are the main producers of real good medicines. The active ingredients of our medicines, sold in pharmacy, often come from China or India. But on the other hand, there is a whole fake medicines trafficking. Bernard Leroy, the president of IRACM, the International Institute of Research Against Counterfeit Medicines, confirms this as well. In China, for example, it's absolutely amazing. China has become the major legitimate supplier of the pharmacy industry. They provide high-quality raw material, no problem. But there are drug traffickers who build a diverted industry and produce fake, low-dosage drugs. And then someone will steal legal raw material from the factory and will start his own fake medicine business. For traffickers, exporting this illicit production is not as risky as transporting cocaine or any other narcotic. It's relatively easy for a customs agent to recognize drugs. But how can an agent know if a shipment of pharmaceuticals is from the legal or illegal circuit? It's a real challenge for law enforcement. It's true that detection is not easy for customs authorities or police when faced with fake meds. You have to have the tools to test the drugs when they arrive and then send the tests to the laboratory. And that takes time. Sophisticated tools from traffickers makes the authorities' work more difficult. Well, it's getting quite difficult now because we see now that the illicit business has its own supply chain. They are really working with the production plant. They have their own transport companies. They have their own um, customers. So they have their own network. And it gets much more difficult now to find out who's um, working in the illicit uh, business and who's working in the illicit one. It's even more complicated because some companies buy raw material legally, but then use it to produce fake medicine. And according to Rika Putonen, this is absolutely real. 
She heads the UNODC Anti-Counterfeit Medicine Office at the UNODC, the international agency that fights organized crime. Also, what is very often used when we talk about falsified medical products is um, legal entities, legal persons, uh, as we lawyers would call, call them. Um, so corporations, companies, and uh, because they can also be very nicely used as a, as a cover um, to hide the illegal activity carried out by this particular company. So a perfectly legitimate uh, company producing pharmaceuticals, uh, medicines or medical products can have like a side production of falsified stuff where uh, the active ingredients are not present in the medicine in the, in the right amount. It's up to health authorities in each importing country to make sure that medicine that's sold on the market is in accordance with public health regulations and that its composition is really what the container says it is. In the Netherlands, this is the work of Dr. Bastian van Hoos, a researcher at the National Institute for Public Health. The big problems are um, the type of products, what is in it, what is not in it, uh, it's reliable. Uh, so what you find today may not be the same as what you find tomorrow. And uh, at the same time, um, the criminals are creative in how they find their way to our markets. So we have continuously have to adapt um, blocking routes to the markets, but also have to adapt our detection methods in, in the laboratory. Because the, um, well, the criminals are really creative in trying to hide uh, that they're making uh, a bad product. Here's a particular example. Um, it's a, a product for erectile dysfunction. It's supposed to be a herbal product, but um, just because we got a health complaint, uh, we started investigating. We knew there had to be something. And since we did not find it in the powder inside the uh, capsule shell, it had to be somewhere. So we, first we started rinsing the inside of the capsule, um, but we found some active ingredient, but not a lot. And then we cut it open and we photographed it. And then under a microscope, we saw all these tiny white specks in this case, it is Tadalafil, which is an erectile dysfunction drug. So this is how we shown that um, Tadalafil was in the uh, gelatine uh, capsule shell. And this is one example of how they, well, for, for some time have succeeded in uh, eluding us, but uh, not anymore. Now, now we know. Camouflaging an active ingredient allows a product to be relatively effective without having to comply with the strict rules for the sale of medicine. The trade is about returning customers. Um, and if you want a person to come back to you, you have to supply the person with a product that does something. And that doesn't mean that it's, uh, you have to supply them with a qualitative high standard product, but you have to give them something which gives the impression to the user that it works. You don't need good ingredients. You don't need to respect the right proportions. So you might think that anyone could become a fake medication producer. And this turns out to be absolutely correct. So organized criminal groups um, even though we think of all these mafia-type organizations when we talk about organized crime, they also really go from these very complex uh, hierarchical structures to these smaller, flexible, opportunistic groups who just meet a certain demand. We face all sorts of cases, since it's a sector in which criminals can obtain a fairly rapid and substantial profit. There's industrial manufacturing, there are truly organized networks, and other people who decide to make a little money and, if they find consumers, a market a little less demanding, they won't hesitate to jump into it. The IRACM did the first study on organized crime and fake medicines. So the fantasies, well, it's the, the organized crime from the French connection, with all the clichés of the Sicilians and so on. 
Now, we're facing a new and very different form of organized crime. Suddenly, a doctor or a pharmacist decide to set their own traffic with no ties to any organized crime. In India, and we've seen this many times, a French TV station reported on this kind of traffic, that people are able to buy wrappers on the Internet for 2,500 euros or dollars. They set it in an apartment, and they're able to make 500,000 pills in an afternoon. There is also a much more subtle way to produce counterfeit medicine. Sometimes, mafias manage to corrupt the practices of the legal drug market to sell falsified merchandise. A short explanation is needed. In Europe, there is a trade practice called parallel importing. Basically, countries that export medicine are obliged to import them in return and vice versa. These exchanges are within a community between neighboring countries. If the papers are in order, transactions take place with full confidence. The problem is that the Italian mafia understood how to make profit. They repeatedly stole trucks of real medicines, 38 tons of medicines, which they took to countries like Romania, and did all the procedure requested by the European Commission to reintroduce the medicines. This is parallel import into other European countries. And in a number of cases, profits are made because the medicines come from stolen trucks, and so they carry a false procedure with a fake local distributor, and so on. But we have faced cases where they've increased the dosage in liquid medicinal products. Two years ago, we had an issue with a drug called Hercepta, beginning with an H, which is an anti-cancer drug found tampered in certain pharmacies in Germany. Germany, which is the most serious country in the world, has been the victim of this kind of manipulation. Illegal medicine production is as diversified as it is inventive. Traffickers must meet intense international demand. People around the world share the desire to want to take care of themselves and feel good. This is what makes trafficking false medicine a global market. So uh, the market is huge. It's much larger than for uh, drugs and narcotics, because we are all consumers. So that, I think, is one of the key reasons why organized crime gets involved in, in manufacturing and trafficking in falsified medical products. The markets uh, are very, very diverse, um, as are the diseases in different parts of the world that those markets try to uh, address. So then, of course, uh, organized criminal groups also adapt to the market that is, uh, that is present. And how the market can then be um, uh, met, how the demand can be met, is very, very diverse. The global counterfeit medicine market adapts to demand. It's not the same in countries that possess a good health system as in countries where there is almost no system. Traffickers have adapted easily to this bipolar market. In the north, medicines that help you feel better are called comfort medicines. In the south, surviving the most common illnesses is most important. The traffic is perfectly organized to specifically respond to the demands of each of these two markets. In the poorest countries, it's the price that matters. Traffickers prosper in poor countries, where impoverished people have difficulty affording medicines in pharmacies. The alternative is to buy medicine individually in the street, or in the markets where medicines are exposed for hours to the sun. Usually the medicine is already partly deteriorated because of the exposure to the heat. We're in Cotonou, the largest city in Benin. For several years, this country has been fighting against the sale of illegal medications in street markets. Police, health authorities and pharmacists are united to eradicate a traffic that is deeply rooted in Beninese habits. Senior Police Superintendent Brice Alouanu is the Deputy Director of Cotonou's Judicial Police. You know, criminal organizations 
use the low standard of living of the underdeveloped countries, because they know there is poverty in these countries and that people are looking for cheaper products, and that in these countries, supervisory bodies are not functioning well. Mafias always take advantage of a system's weaknesses. When it's on a country level, it becomes an extremely lucrative market. Dr. Henri Charles Ainadou is the president of Benin's Pharmacists Association. There were pharmacies that existed normally in the 1950s and 60s. But in the meantime, there was the revolution in 1972. And the government at that time, the military government, was in control. They had a monopoly. And then somehow they went bankrupt and the state pulled out. Dr. Landry Yansunu is the deputy director of the health minister's cabinet. So that's how, little by little, it started. And everyone became a pharmacist or a medicine seller. And it was a national hobby until we put an end to it. Authorities are often obliged to fight against stubborn prejudices, a kind of natural marketing that pushes consumers towards the black market. For the people, particularly in Benin, medicines sold in pharmacies are considered much too expensive. They just need to make discounts to attract customers. You know, we are in Africa. There are poor countries. So the purchasing power is very, very low. So people are saying, if I want drugs at, say, a thousand in a pharmacy, and that I get it for a hundred here with a small seller who carries it on her head, I better take it faster here for a hundred. It's all profit for me. The only tools available to the authorities are information campaigns. This is a kind of counteroffensive to promote generic medicines with lower prices and to change people's habits. In Western countries, there are also campaigns against counterfeit medicine. The context is clearly different, and the products offered are not the same as in Africa. What mainly interests customers in industrialized countries, and therefore mafias as well, are the so-called comfort medicines. These products don't directly treat an illness, but they help you feel better or perform better. Traffickers don't spend a cent to publicize their business. Society does it for free. The society puts a lot of pressure on us to be a certain way, to look a certain way, to act a certain way, and uh, that's where lifestyle medicines uh, come into play. And then organized criminal groups uh, abuse again uh, the fact that we want to um, perform in a way that the society expects us to perform. Uh, and that's where lifestyle medicines like Viagra come into play. Viagra is a bestseller in the legal economy. The blue pill was invented in 1999 and immediately became an unprecedented success. Around 50 euros of Viagra pills are bought every second around the world. It's an expensive product. It's a recognized brand. That's all it took for traffickers to appropriate it and make it the best-selling product in the world of counterfeiting. Fake Viagra, instead of costing 50 or even a little bit more for a few pills, on the internet, they'll offer 200 tablets for $400.
we go from a 40 euro box of pills to a 2 euro box. It's the deal of the century. It's a price that most consumers like. That's certainly what came out of an enlightening study led by Dr. Van Huys in the Netherlands. We came up with an idea of monitoring wastewater. In, in, uh, after taking a medicine, uh, the medicine is uh, broken down by the body. It is excreted. People go to the lavatory and they flush the lavatory and it goes with weight, wastewater to the uh, sewage purification plant. And we sampled three of those plants for three cities and we just measured how much of uh, Viagra uh, had been consumed. And at the same time, we, uh, we asked the pharmacies in that area, how much did you sell? And we compared both. And it turned out that 70% of what we detect in wastewater does not come out of the pharmacy, but from the illegal market. So the illegal market must be much bigger than the legal market. This success can be explained by the relative effectiveness of these counterfeit medicines. Fake Viagra needs to be effective, so it contains an active ingredient that combats impotence. So, with Viagra, for example, it's quite impressive to see how the fake medicines can contain the right active ingredient, but with totally the wrong dosages. It can be both less, and it can be more. We had Viagra, which was a lot stronger than it should be. Finally, we're facing counterfeit medicines that are a lot stronger than real medicines, which causes serious problems. We've seen there are cases of erections that lasted so long, it ended in gangrene, with sex amputation. Well, that's quite far from the expected result. Despite the risk to consumers, the illegal pharmaceutical market continues to grow all over the world. Counterfeiting medicine knows no limits. All products are affected. It can be anti-malarial drugs, it can be antibiotics, it can be vaccines, it can be comfort medicines. All products are affected, all medicines, whether generic or otherwise, are subject to forgery. The market is huge, even if demand isn't the same in every part of the world. To fulfill it efficiently, organized crime has set up distribution networks that are perfectly adapted to consumer habits. In Benin, the people are used to buying medicine at the market. In Cotonou, the Adjigule market was the biggest fake medicine market in West Africa. Behind this illegal trade, there are economic players who find this traffic very profitable. By forgetting, of course, that this traffic, this crime, have negative impact on both public health and security. Well, it's a big mafia. You should know that it's an international mafia. So these representatives, the same as drugs traffickers, they have sponsors, who have some money, and who are sometimes in politics, and therefore they want to do everything to make some quick money. And you know sometimes the little ladies that we arrest for selling counterfeit medicines? They're just the small fry of this big network. At first glance, this network seems to serve its customers. With a simple prescription, people go to get their medicine just as they would in any pharmacy. We did a little experiment with the help of Dr. Ainadu. And so I asked the doctor to prescribe. There we have Viagra, there we have Amlo, which is amodipine, and we have amoxicillin. After a few minutes spent in the market, Dr. Ainadu's accomplices come back with medication. Eventually, someone directed us to a warehouse, so we went there, but didn't find any. But we were directed to another one, where we found some. Heart medicine, antibiotics, and of course, Viagra. And all of it three to four times cheaper than at any pharmacy. 
However, it's impossible to know at first glance if they're real or fake, unless you take a closer look. No, it's not, because it says it's manufactured in 2014, and here it says on the box, manufactured 2016. So either blister do not match with this box. There's a color difference. Uh, there's a difference in, uh, in the dimensions of the tablets, of the blister packs. So to me, this is suspicious. Concerning the amoxicillin, the antibiotic, without a full panel of tests, it's impossible to know if the drug is genuine. On the other hand, seizures have proved that the dosing of most of these antibiotics was lower, so they didn't contain the correct dosage of the active component. That, that's one of the outcomes. If, you, if there's not enough in it, then uh, that's a risk of antimicrobial resistance because you're undertreated and it, it, it will take longer for you to recover it will, it, and that will uh, give the bacteria the time to adapt to the amoxicillin. But it also extends to vaccines. There are also uh, counterfeit vaccines uh, in, in Africa. Um, and that's, well, that's more than one person that, that can suffer from that, that uh, can have an effect on a population. In industrialized countries, mafias have a distribution platform that has caused the sale of fake medicine to explode. It's convenient, discreet, and available to everyone. The internet. The idea is this. It's embarrassing to ask for these medicines from your doctor. They're expensive, so that's why they're demands from customers. Well, we have a very good social security system here in France. It's normal. There's no place for such a supply. The importance of social networks must be added to this. They unintentionally and almost naturally do the advertising for the traffickers. Fear of illness or an epidemic is not exclusive to developing countries. It can also be found easily on any medical forum. Traffickers are very responsive to the news, very responsive to new methods of communication. And it's true that they jump on any opportunity to dispense products they can manufacture and resell. And they make a lot of money. And I would say, and I say this to everybody I know, I would never order over the internet because it's so much easier to distribute falsified things, uh, falsified um, medicines, uh, whatever it may be actually, over the internet. So I would personally never do that, uh, nor for my family members. There are on the internet quite legal controlled websites, but there are fewer. Most sites are illegal and suspicious sites. And we take a risk. We shouldn't take any risk because medicine is not a product like any other. It is a very special product. Mike Isles has long worked for the legal pharmaceutical industry. Frightened by the proliferation of sites selling counterfeit medicine on the internet, he created an NGO to alert the highest European authorities about the dangers of selling medicine online. The problem is that there are about 30,000 illegally operating websites pointed at you and me at any one moment. So how can you identify if those websites that you're going to, how do you know if they're real or not? And that's a real challenge for people to understand what is a real website that is selling genuine medicines and what is not. For the teenagers, who are wanting, for instance, to buy slimming pills or something like this, there is significant danger in doing this because, again, you are taking yourself outside of your normal health system and that can be very dangerous. And so the health consequences are extremely important and can potentially, as I've said, be very dangerous to you. Fiona Parry lived this experience. This English mother of three teenagers was confronted with the worst-case scenario. Her oldest daughter, Eloise, had decided to lose a little weight. She was able to buy a product on the internet that was supposed to help her. Eloise bought 
slimming pills, diet pills, on the internet. Um, and as a result of taking those pills, she died. That's the, the simplest way of explaining what happened to her. And what she bought was, was not a medicine. It was poison. A poison that's sold without a prescription on the internet. Eloise ordered diet pills containing dinitrophenol, a trendy active ingredient that's supposed to burn fat with great efficiency and for good reason. It's an industrial chemical. It's used in explosives and in dye manufacture. It is not safe to eat. The reason it made her lose weight is because it was poisoning her. Um, so it does work, but it makes you very ill at the same time. And if you take more than your body can handle, you will die. There is nothing anyone can do to stop that. There is no medicine, no treatment, no antidote. Websites masquerading as legitimate online pharmacies are run by criminals who just want your money. Unlike qualified healthcare professionals, criminals who sell medicines over the internet have no regard for your health. Their only motivation is profit. The internet is also the ideal sales platform for medications that are sometimes difficult to obtain without a prescription or which is simply not available in one's own country. The solution, if you'd like to buy something anyway, is to turn to the dark web, the hidden side of the internet. It's a part of the internet that you can't access unless you download specific software. And then when you download that software, you can access websites that are only available using that software. And initially, this was designed way back in the late 80s to enable encrypted conversations. It was designed by the, by the US military originally. And like anything that's designed for good, you can abuse it, you can use it for bad as well. This uh, that I've brought up on my screen now is a, is a medicine for sale. Is it real? Is it fraudulent? I don't know. What's being sold on this market is uh, Sandoz methylphenidate or Ritalin, as it's more commonly known. So a psychoactive drug typically used for children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And they're selling, apparently, on this market, uh, 30 or 40 Ritalin tablets for 40 euros. Now, two questions come to mind there. Firstly, is it really Ritalin? You might get the box that says Ritalin. You might get foil tablets inside where you can press a tablet out. But how do you know that that's what that is? The second question, I think it's the more important question, is if you need a psychoactive drug to treat ADHD, why are you buying it on the dark net? Is that perhaps this drug simply isn't available in some countries and that this may be the only method that a parent who's trying to do something to help their kid feels that they can do. But the risk that they take in doing that is almost impossible to measure because they don't know what they're getting. Why would somebody sell antipsychotic medicine over the dark net? Why would somebody buy an antipsychotic medicine over the, uh, over the dark net for their children? Uh, the reasons may be manifold. One of the reasons could be that uh, it is simply cheaper. A global market, free and natural advertising, a distribution network that adapts to demand and any budget perfectly. This is every entrepreneur's dream, but it's a reality for the traffickers of fake medication and consequently a source of huge profits. Given the diversity and scale of counterfeit medicine trafficking, it's difficult to quantify it. It's even more difficult because it's a relatively new criminal market and authorities haven't quite grasped it yet. There's just not enough research to say for sure. So there's definitely a lack of data, lack of analysis and lack of global research, looking at, the, looking at the whole world and looking at the markets in all these different parts of the world and how the, how the illicit market uh, functions. Um, so 
I don't think anybody can say for sure. We think it represents around $80 billion. Some have mentioned up to $200 billion. Having said that, we're in a situation which we took into consideration only since 1985. So we try to explore it, but it's only a theoretical approach. And for this reason, we tend to claim anything on the subject, and we make things look spectacular. In any case, that would represent the equivalent of 10% of the normal pharmacy market, which is $800, $900 billion. We have no idea, to be perfectly honest. We've seen huge amounts of money. So one of our confiscation orders uh, was £14 million. Pounds. That shows you the kind of scale and the kind of money that can be made during this type of criminality. Money is the main driver in organized crime. But with counterfeit medicine trafficking, mafias also enjoy many indirect benefits. And the main one is the near inexistence of penalties. Because breaking the uh, medicine sect is a violation. And that's something different than a crime. So it's that that's very different from uh, breaking the law for drugs, for, for heroin, for cocaine. That automatically is a, is makes it a crime. But there are initiatives which uh, which is called the Metacrime uh, Convention by the Council of Europe. And one of the goals for that convention is to criminalize the illegal trade in medicines. In many countries where their system is based on intellectual property rights, they don't even have jails, they only have fines. You have countries like Senegal, where the penalty is six days to 60 days imprisonment for big traffickers. If you think of the supply chain of, say, getting cocaine from Colombia across the seas into a country and all of the infrastructures needed, people on the streets, it's very complex. And the penalties, if you get caught, are very high. When you think of a medicine, you go online, you order your medicine, somebody in another country puts it in an envelope, puts it in the post, and you get it. And so the supply chain is very, very tight, very easy compared to something like smuggling drugs. We've got evidence that more and more serious, organized criminals are becoming involved in medicine's crime. For example, the largest Mexican cartel is more and more interested in switching from drug trafficking to fake medicines trade because there's little risk and it brings a lot more money. Cocaine is less of an issue for Americans than before, and the aging population of the United States is taking more and more small pink, green and blue pills, and so organized crime is interested in that. Given the size and growth of the fake drug market, authorities have begun to organize, but there's a long way to go. Only the MHRA in England has the legal means to track and arrest traffickers. Other monitoring agencies in Europe and elsewhere in the world have no judicial power. So the MHRA enforcement group are quite unique. So not only are we a regulator, but we're also an enforcement agency. So we have a unique position where our enforcement, our criminal enforcement, is part of the regulatory agency. Most agencies in Europe rely on the police to do their enforcement. Now, the police have many other priorities other than medicines. Fortunately, that is our priority. The fact that there is only one monitoring agency in the world able to tackle the problem of selling illegal drugs is a bit frightening. On the other hand, it's perfectly comforting for the criminals, as well as the future of this market. The authorities really began to organize 10 years ago. It required a strong response from government authorities that was in line with this worldwide criminal activity. This is how Operation Pangea was born.
Initially, the Pangea operation was created by MHRA and then joined by Interpol. The aim was to raise awareness of the risks related to the purchase of medicines on the Internet. It's an operation that began 10 years ago. Today, there are 123 countries participating in this operation. This means that, unfortunately, this is a global problem. So this is a week of action in which all countries join forces to fight this crime on the net, but also by controlling postal shipments and following up on investigations connected to seizures in order to dismantle the networks behind this traffic. The operation takes place each year on dates that are kept secret. The goal is to surprise the traffickers in every country involved at the same time. Keeping the secret is not always easy, especially in Benin, where traffickers have ears everywhere. It was not easy, because the most critical phase for us is leaving the intellectual part to go to the operational part. It's here. Because the people who do this are not innocent people. They are very creative people, very smart and very subtle. So they have the art, the intuition, they almost floated the Beninese administration. So we had to control the information. Until the last minute, they were fighting us trying to make the operation fail. But thanks to our determination and the time of preparation that we took, we were able this time to defeat these traffickers. And that's how we got these positive results. In Cotonou, the results have been remarkable. The open market for fake drugs has been completely dismantled. Sellers were arrested and merchandise was seized. Around the world, Operation Pangea 10 resulted in the arrest of 400 people and the closure of 3,684 internet sites. The total value seized in just one week was over $50 million. In England, the seizures have even reached record levels. We recovered 4.6 million doses of medicines. Of that 4.6 million doses, not point or less than 0.8 were actually counterfeit. And by counterfeit, I mean that they contravened intellectual property. Everything else was unlicensed medicines, so un not in the regulated supply chain, not licensed for the UK. But they'd come in to be put on the criminal market. So that's a huge amount of medicine and a huge amount of criminal profit that's available, and that's just for the UK. High profits, little prison time. Counterfeit medicine trafficking is the El Dorado of organized crime. It's the ideal criminal business. Particularly since there's still another benefit, especially for the most cowardly traffickers. Uh, because they don't see people dying, they don't pe see people not getting cured, uh, it doesn't have that emotional impact on the criminals to see that I am actually doing great harm here. It is all a bit distant uh, from the organized criminal groups, what happens with the falsified medical products and how people are actually killed as a consequence. If you kill a man with a knife, you're in physical contact. You have to have the mental state of that situation. If you send a product 10,000 kilometers that will kill babies, you're not there when it happens, and so the result of your action is not affecting you. Despite authorities' efforts to regulate and fight counterfeit medicine trafficking, the market's future looks bright. The products that traffickers offer are dangerous, but they still manage to seduce consumers. As long as the vast majority of the world's population doesn't have access to a cheap and effective health system, criminal organizations will be around to satisfy demand. A statement that is no longer reserved for developing countries, but that now affects all industrialized countries. The American grandma who can no longer sleep without her five colors pills in reality, is already an addict. 
And so, it means that in our countries, with our population growing older, we will have an increasingly large market of potential candidates for fake medicines, to the extent that we will probably, with the aging of the population and retirement pension becoming less important, people who have less and less financial means, and therefore, will be more likely tempted by this type of solution. Rather a radical solution. Yeah.